Just to let you know something, this is the season where Nehemiah, where I'm preaching to you out of, is the exact month in the Jewish calendar we're in right now. We're right there. We are right there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's so much I want to get in here today. Probably not going to get it all in, but I'm going to try. I, I believe it's a learning time. When God gets you to the place where you understand, I got to put this in there. You know how uh, the, the prodigal's dad was excited that the boy came home? The boy wasn't excited. He knew he was being an idiot, and he was convicted and repentant. How could dad be so happy when his boy is so distraught? Because his dad knew the boy finally understands. The dad knew since the boy understood he was going to get there. In this Feast of Tabernacles, after he reads the law, the people are crying and Nehemiah says, don't cry, this is a time to rejoice and be glad. I believe it's because they could see. And when you stay in the dark, it's hard to rejoice. But when somebody who's been praying for you or your father's been believing for you, when you get to the place where you know you're wrong, he knows you're on your way. Now, I'm, I'm thinking, God, why would you, these people are miserable. Why are you putting a celebration in the middle of this? It's because they can understand. See, once you understand, you can get out. The prodigal had to come to the place where he appreciated what his dad did for him. Israel had to come to the place that they appreciated that they got delivered again. They lost sight of it. Many of us, let's face it, we got more than the whole world. The world's starting to get wealthier, but let's face it, America's had more than anybody you've ever seen anywhere in history, period. And we complain and whine, and it's the weirdest thing you've ever seen. You would think with all the stuff we got, we'd get it. You know, nobody has, but you know what we need? Oh, I don't want to say that. We need, a, we need an event to cause appreciation. Can I just say it like that? I won't say any more than that. See, they were, Nebuchadnezzar had desolated them and scattered them all over the place. And Nehemiah came to bring order out of the rubble so they could be positioned to see what they didn't know. How many parents are waiting on their kids to figure out what they don't know? Can't make a living, can't take care of themselves, and the parents are just waiting. They're doing their best. They don't know what to do next because the kid needs an enlightenment. And trust me, if a parent, if a kid came home and told the parent, I'm sorry, and I got it, and I should have this or should have did that. He'll be like the prodigal son's dad. He'll be so happy. He'll say, oh, that boy finally understood it after 20 years. We're on our way now. He'll be rejoicing, but the kid will be unhappy because he'll realize he wasted 20 years. But dad knows that it's never too late to get it right. So that boy's going to get a shot. If he, if he can figure out where he is, he's got a chance. But he's further away when he's in denial than he ever would be when it looks its worst when he repents. That's why repentance is a gift from God. I don't know what people think it is, but it's a gift to figure out you don't know what you're doing. It's a gift to figure it out. It's a gift when you, when you see yourself or what you're not and you realize you need God. That's the biggest gift you ever could have got in your whole life right there. And you realize that does away with all the entitlement of you owe me this and you owe me, you're just glad to be breathing. You're so glad that God didn't leave you in the darkness to be a fool the rest of your life that you're so grateful that you become non-judgmental of other people because you know if you didn't have a shot, you'd be just like them or worse. It does away with all that pride, creates humility in your life, and God can use you. God can't use you until you have that experience. That's why God gets all them people that have been lowered. I love going to the prison. 
I love going there. I've said this to you before. All equal. They all got the same clothes. They all got numbers on their shirts. And they all don't have a reputation to keep. God moves so strong in there. It's like going on a missions trip every week to go to the prison and preach. Because they are positioned for God to use His power. If you'll forgive me, most churches think they're all right, so that's hard to feed them. Then blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you already think you're full, there's no appetite. If you always think you know, there's no appetite. Let me tell you, when I'm hungry, those are people who have been around, I have an appetite, man. I want to eat now. When you're hungry, you want to know. I'm not joking. And I'm not saying I know I'm a great preacher. I don't think I, I am. I heard lots of people preach a whole lot better than I do. But I will tell you something. If the world knew what they didn't get, I'm not joking, there should be a line out there that stretches the sheets in Star City because they just don't know what they don't know. It's not that we're, all I got is this anyway. How smart can I be? I read it and I tell you about it. But it is the living word of God and it is true and it is, it's, a, it's living and quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword and it can change your life. That's why you should come. I, don't, I, I know you, you, you get attached to people and preach, but you got to come for God. If you're coming for me, if I hurt your feelings, you won't want to do anything anymore. Wrong. But if you come for God and realize he appointed me to do this and that I'm responsible for what goes on here, then you'll help. But if you think you're doing it for me, it's, it's not going to come out good. Sure, you're doing it for me, but you've got to do it because God put me here to do this, not because of me, because God gave me the responsibility to do it. You see the difference? There's a huge difference. That's how you get in your place and you realize you can't just feel like, I'm not going to do that. I don't feel like it. You're controlling the vision by your feelings. That's why... You know, you know this. You got to crucify the flesh because you can't have a carnal church and have spiritual things happen in it. If you have a carnal church, then only carnal things can happen in it. If you crucify the flesh, the, the spirit can be expressed. And God can do things in the church. But if you're so busy bickering and, and jealousy and all the carnality, how can anything happen? I'm ready for miracles. I'm ready for God's intervention in humanity. It's marching at a crazy pace. We need some interruptions. Anyway, so we're right there in that time. The prodigal son came to his senses, just like Israel came to their senses. And they became repentant toward God and they put on sackcloth and ashes and were repenting. That's why I'm telling you, Nehemiah's book is so good. I wish I could figure out how to package that up for, for, for leaders, corporate leaders and stuff. I'm telling you, I think he's the greatest leader there ever was. Aside from Jesus. Matthew 13, 16, Jesus said, Blessed are your eyes for they do see and your ears for they do hear. Even though, oh man, even though they were convicted... It wasn't time to mourn. It was time to rejoice. So when you, you start to get what you need to know, God has got you positioned. See, the whole point, he gets you positioned to give you the word. And the word begins to change you. See, we thought we could change people by pointing at them. And I will tell you, people change because of the scripture, which is what, ne they just sat there and read, read the Bible. It'd be like we just read the Bible and then everybody leaves. Just read the Bible and then everybody goes home. The Word will do the work. We got too busy being Messiahs and trying to control and save everybody. And all the women couldn't get their husbands to church because they were telling them what to do. 
Please forgive me, ladies. I'm just being honest. Instead of letting God do it and being like Sarah, because the scripture says, model it with the man so that he may see by your good behavior that he wants to be saved too. Instead of going, you better not, you better quit, you know you should. And same with the, the men. You can go to work and point at other people and do the same thing. It's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance, not the rebukes of a mate. God had them totally dependent. After, after they, what they were remembering, and then I should close here soon, but what they were remembering, do you realize that God had a pillar of fire at night to keep them warm? Do you realize that he put a cloud by day so the sun wouldn't burn them up while they was in the desert? Do you realize that water came out of rocks for people to drink? That at manna, you'd get up in the morning and there was manna on the ground. They were totally dependent on God. And God made them rehearse all of their first experience when they were taken out of Egypt because it was going to bring back the appreciation and the repentance that they needed to get real with God. We can use some of that. We can certainly use to see how God good, good God is. Because, you know, I'm a lot like Peter. When Jesus looked good, I think to myself, oh, I'm a sinful man. You remember Peter said, get out of here. I'm no good, Jesus. Get away from me. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Because godly sorrow works repentance. It's hard to look at the light and then see who you really are. But I think we all need to do it. You know, my, my wife has a picture, I forget what room it's in, where this guy's holding a magnifying glass on himself and God's looking through it the other way. And God is examining his man. I think we need a good examination. You know, we go get examined all the time. I think we need a good spiritual examination. Look at the country. Can't you tell? All the foundations are being eroded. And see, I will not blame the world ever. Jesus, Jesus said, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So is it their fault or our fault? We don't participate, we're immature, and we need a massage every Sunday to come to church. Please forgive me. And I'm not saying y'all are like that. I'm just saying across the board, you gotta be entertaining, you gotta have the right show, you gotta do all this stuff. Our people don't. What about your relationship with God? What about that? Isn't, shouldn't that be enough that you, you're grateful that you're saved, you're not dead, your kids are still living, you're breathing? Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, when you look at some of the Old Testament serv services and even the New Testament services, how Jesus talked to people, it was not very entertaining. It was very convicting. They forgot where they came from, so they became ungrateful. The feast was not limited. See, I think we need to get the world in here. I didn't say their practices. See, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. We're supposed to be around the world and not become like the world. See how the church that's reaching out is full of people in different places. Can you have 150 unsaved people in here and it's okay and it not change the atmosphere? See, we're supposed to be able to take them in the presence of God, not let them take the service down. Amen. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, you will not do that unless you worship at your house. Amen. If you're not gonna worship at home, you will come here like a junkie wanting to get your church fix. And so you'll be a draw instead of a fountain. Now you realize I'm shifting responsibility to, to believers. It's not the pastor and the people. It's God's people. If you worship God yourself, You'll come to church all fired up, not because it's pre-meditated. You'll just be full of God. 
before you get here. This feast was meant for strangers. Matthew, or just turn to Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7. And then I'll, I'll stop. Probably cup's probably overflowing anyway. I'm probably pushing too much in. I'm trying to adjust our perception of church and thus be effective. Place where people who don't know God could come here and get to know Him instead of fitting our box. I hate boxes. I'm not good. If you make a box, I probably won't get in it. I hate to say that. I just probably won't get in it. Verse 6 says, And the sons of a stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Now Jesus quoted this scripture later. Uh, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. I realize that we have to have holy services and, and we want to move a God and all that. But I think God is reaching out instead of trying us to have another goosebump. Now, if you come to church, and I'm not saying we shouldn't have miracles, healings, and goosebumps. But maybe God, don't, if we got goosebumps, we'd just have a club again. And maybe he don't want us to be a club. Maybe he wants us to go out there and we just keep shopping for higher services instead of responsibility. Tough day, isn't it? Not really. Well, I just don't feel like I used to. Maybe God cut it off and make you do something else. Because if you had the same feeling, you'd do the same thing over. And he's wanting something different. It's a new day. People shop for the highest services, but I, I don't see them shopping for responsibility. Jesus said, the work is great, the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. See, he's looking for help. And we're looking for a feeling. We should have feelings. Our services will go up. We'll have great things. But God's looking for people who care about what he wants done, not just another goosebump. We, we, we create an environment that really isn't conducive to our cause. We can't even get along with each other, let alone the world. Jesus said offenses, it's impossible for offenses not to come. You want to come to church, you're going to be offended. I said this before. This is a joke. Dr. John quotes it every once in a while when he wants to tease me. He said, I said years ago when I first started figuring out how everybody gets offended. It sounds so bad, but it's really. I said the first thing they ought to do when somebody comes to church is get the biggest guy to punch him and knock him back out the door. <laughs> they said, Why? And you need to tell them, if you can't get over that, you won't be worth nothing here. Because you're going to get offended coming to church because everybody's in a different place. This one is sanctified. This one is not. This one is still abrasive. This one don't have the character of Christ. So they're abrasive and they say things you don't like. How are you going to get through all that if you're just touchy-feely all the time? They hurt my feelings. Okay. You ought to be up here. I get mine hurt all the time. It doesn't matter my feelings. It matters what we're supposed to do. Now, you realize I'm trying to take you to a place where there's a much more mature place where you're not moved by your feelings. You're moved by your purpose. I don't feel married today. Is that right, honey? <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? It's not how it works. We're moved by our purpose. And see, when you do your purpose, you become mature because you can start telling yourself what to do. Let's stand to our feet. You know, I, I want you to know, really, it's a privilege to do this with you. 
I really appreciate God letting me say anything. You understand? I'm not trying to do anything bad. I'm grateful that God allows me to talk. I get grateful if, if it sounds crazy, if I get to dig a ditch and, it's, and I get to do something that I feel good and want to do, I'm grateful. I, I just have gratitude for God. See, I think we just forget how bad it can really be. We are a very blessed nation and we are a very blessed group of people. And if we'd appreciate it, we might get to keep it. But if we think we got it owed to us, I can't imagine us getting to keep it. It's no worse than a son saying, Dad, you owe me. He's just not going to get much out of Dad. We're going to do a fast pretty soon because that's the next phase. That's the reaction of the people when they get sober about what they've done. So really, we're just kind of following this Nehemiah book. And like I said, coincidentally, we are right in the season that the book was written. Father, we are so grateful this morning. God, thank you that you are going to help us be sons and daughters, to be teachable, that like the prodigal, he was still a son, but he came to his senses. I thank you, Father, that we will come to our senses today. This week, Lord, deal with us. Help us read Nehemiah, God, the scriptures that we become grateful and thankful for what we have and what you've done. That we'll rehearse, just like Israel rehearsed their deliverance from Egypt, we'll rehearse our deliverance from the world and we'll have gratitude. And God, I thank you that the word will come alive and we'll see what we don't know and you'll rejoice because we're learning. Thank you, Father, that you see us as sons not somebody to beat, but a child to love and teach and correct. God, thank you for all the prodigals in this ministry coming home, God, that we're not diminishing, we're increasing because of the prodigals are coming home. Thank you, God, that this will be a place like the Feast of Tabernacles where people can come from outside and not know God at all and be able to learn to worship and understand and get saved and that we'll know how to handle them and make it so they can. That we won't be religious and condemning. We'll be affirming and loving in the name of Jesus. That the environment will be good here this morning and this day forward for people who do not know God to come to this house that we'll be comfortable bringing all our non-believing friends and just let it happen. In the name of Jesus. If you're in here this morning and you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, what I, when I say that, that's not a cliche. What you're saying is, I have done things wrong and Jesus is taking the punishment that I should have gotten. Because, you know, when you do stuff wrong, you have punishment coming. And what Jesus did was he said, don't punish them. Punish me. That's what the cross is all about. He literally took the punishment that we were supposed to get and said, let them go, God. Punish me. Now, you realize that made salvation available to every single person that's ever been born since the beginning of time. All they got to do is admit they're wrong, and that should be easy. We do enough wrong. It shouldn't be hard to figure out we've done something wrong. But pride will keep you from admitting that. That's why God says, I hate the proud, but I give grace to the humble. I resist the proud. So if you just this morning accept that you have done things wrong, and you're accepting that Jesus took punishment that you should have gotten, we want to pray with you this morning. 
That's what secures your place in heaven. It's not all the good deeds you do. It's not how perfect you are. It's the fact that you accept that you were going to be punished and Jesus intervened and said, punish me and let them go. You'd think that would be easy for people to do, don't, wouldn't you? Let, but they have a hard time with it. If that's you this morning, I do want you to come up here and not anywhere else but here. Not to put you on the spot, but you know, Jesus called people publicly. I, I always see in the scripture, we just talk to people openly. That's one thing I liked about Jesus. You knew where he stood. Hallelujah. I love talking to people. If you don't like me, I just soon you tell me I don't like you because I, I can't deal with all the politics. I need to know where I stand. And I think Jesus did that. He called them brood vipers, empty tombs, the religious people. So if that's you today, please come up. If you're watching us by television and you have never done that, we're going to go ahead and give you that opportunity today. If you would, repeat after me. Say, Father, I come in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge, God, that you're right and that I am wrong. I repent of my sin. I receive Jesus as my Savior. I thank you for my salvation. I thank you, Lord, for a desire for the word. Help me find a church. Give me a pastor, somebody to watch over my life. And I thank you, God, for my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us this morning and you don't have a local church or you don't have a ministry that you can go to. If you desire, we will send you a Bible in the mail. We will send you a book called Welcome to the Family. If we can help you find a local church, we'll do that too. So we just want to be a blessing to your life and add to you. So you'll see an uh, uh, address or a phone number on the bottom of the screen that'll be able to help you with that. Amen.